Okay, welcome everyone to Sensory Cell Solutions, Therapeutic Strategies for Parents and Educators. I'm your host, Amy Starkey, and I have a very special guest to uh, introduce today. This is Miss Farah Rains. Farah has been a pediatric occupational therapy assistant for 18 years now. She is the author of a children's book. She is a, a content creator. She has a blog as well as amazing videos that I can't wait for her to share with us. And she's also created a really interesting class, a sensory movement class, not only for children ages three and up, but also for adults. So please welcome Farah Rains to the show today, to our podcast. Thank you, Farah, for being here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Very excited to get into everything you're doing and hear all the wonderful things you're doing. So if you'd like to kind of give us a backstory about um, just your personal history, a little bit about that and how you got into occupational therapy and into all the areas that you're doing with children right now, that would be great. Sure. <laughs> so um, what inspired me to get into occupational therapy was um, a personal experience when I was little. I was about 11 years old. I was diagnosed with bacterial meningitis and um, it was, it was life threatening. Mm -hmm. um, I, it was quite the experience. It was, it was very challenging. Um, I had to overcome learning to walk again. Wow. And because of that experience, I feel like, you know, um, they, those therapists helped me. So mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to get in that field to help other kids. So, um, yeah, that, that right there, I knew I wanted to work with kids. Yes. Yeah. So, um, and the one thing that I like to do, um, is blog. Okay. And usually it's about my personal experience. So if you want to hear more about that experience, I wrote a blog and it was called Finding My Superpower. Oh, wonderful. Finding My yeah. Superpower. Okay. We'll put a yes. link to that at the bottom yes. of the, of the uh, podcast. I'll definitely link to that. Great. Great. And what I mean about superpower, I just feel like I, I'm just a firm believer that everybody has something special yes. that they can share with others. And, you know, I feel like I found my superpower mm -hmm. and I just try to, you know, share it with as many people as I can, um, you know, and I just keep creating new stuff and, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like you said, my videos and my books and just, you know, anything to share my superpower to help others, you know, um, absolutely. absolutely. It's yeah. I, that's what we're here for. You know, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're definitely doing that. And I think it just really gives therapists a, a professional advantage when you have a history, a personal advantage or a personal history going through therapy and going through those experiences that require different types of therapy or occupational therapy in this case. So you really get to understand what that's like to go through. And I think it makes you a better therapist for it. Don't, would you agree? Yes. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Especially at 11 years old, that could be such a scary experience for a child to go through. So it's just really wonderful that you've had that history and that helps you to help your pediatric clients now today. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I you know, Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, please. Um, at that age, I was really into uh, dance and okay. I was, uh, you know, competing at that, that competition level. Yeah. And, uh, you know, how scary to think that, you know, what I loved at that time was going to yes. be taken away. Yes. So that was my drive, you know, <sighs> to, to work hard and um, you know, I was determined to, mm -hmm. you know, get back to where I was. So that is, that's, 
And you, as you know, with occupational therapy, so much of what we do is focused around the volitional meaning for the client. So what has volitional meaning to them and and what did they want to do? What occupation for kids that could be anything, a hobby, you know, whatnot, but for you, it was dance. So, you you know, you were able to incorporate that into your therapy session and that motivate you, motivate you. So that is fantastic. Yeah. And definitely one of the many reasons I love occupational therapy so much. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, yes, well, I agree. <laughs> I have been watching your videos and they are just so fun. Would you be able to share a little bit about them? Just talk about them and tell us where we could find them and what sure. inspires you, how you make them just a little bit more about your videos. Yeah. So you can find them um, on YouTube mm-hmm. or on my website. Um, it would be um, Miss Movement and Fun.com. Okay. And the YouTube is Miss Fair uh, Fun and movement. So basically what got me into doing the videos was the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Uh, Before that, I, it never even crossed my mind to do videos. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I I'm, I'm glad that I'm, I'm doing them now, but um, the pandemic, we had to go remote Mm -hmm. and that really pushed us all out of our comfort zone. For sure. Yeah. And I just started brainstorming, like, you know, what can I do to reach my student? And I just started, you know, coming up with videos and basically um, structuring those videos, kind of like how I do my um, OT sessions. Okay. And a lot of times I do uh, push-in therapy, which means I go into the classroom and I provide therapy within the whole group. So um, it's not your traditional, you know, pull out, um, which is nice, especially at that younger age, because then I can incorporate their peers Yes. yes. right into, you know, the peer modeling. It's so important. Absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of times our kiddos, we ask them to do something and they just have no interest. But mm-hmm. if Johnny, their, you know, their neighbor is doing it, they jump right in. For so sure. the push in therapy really helps um, for that. But uh, I started doing videos, you know, where I would do like an intro usually like some sort of story Mm -hmm. and then we would do some sort of movement activity whether it be geared around music or just you know some sort of fun type of movement uh I am just I I'm a firm believer the kids you know it's a great way to learn get them up get them moving absolutely (laughs) yes yeah yeah Yeah. so then I we usually at school we do themes and I just love, you know, doing some sort of fun theme. I feel like you get that buy-in from the kids. It holds their attention longer. For sure. So when I plan my videos, a lot of times, you know, it's either based on what we're doing at, at school or maybe, you know, I get feedback from some of my kiddos. Hey, you know, what's your favorite TV show or what are you really into? A lot of our kids are really into dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which is why I did a dinosaur video, you know, or some sort of animal. So uh-huh. that's usually, I I go right to the kids and say, hey, what, you know, what are you into? Yeah. Yeah. Again, that what has meaning for them and then building your session around that or building your video around that. Yeah. Right. To get that buy-in. I think it's wonderful all the activities you do in your videos and then also in your your school model because so often when we're just pulling one of those students out, it's such a disruption for the for their schedule, for the teacher, for just for the class. They can kind of get distracted. So everything that I imagine you're doing can go right into that classroom for all of the students to do and can benefit the whole class and give the teacher a break as well as some you know helpful pointers on how to do these things throughout the day for everybody. Yes. And, you know, um, the carryover is 
is just amazing. Um, it's good. You know, yeah. the teachers and the para pros, they see what I'm doing and, you know, throughout the week, I, I see it carried over and nice. uh, they just automatically do it, which is great. That really feels good. I imagine that lets you know that it's it's sinking in and it's working and just, yeah, that's rewarding, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> cool. Very good. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Um, I do want to hear more about the sensory movement class as well. You just have so many cool things going on. So <laughs> just going through them one by one. Would you tell us a little bit about the sensory movement classes? Sure. So I was honored enough to be asked by a dance instructor who uh -huh. just recently opened up her studio. Uh, she had previously owned one a few years ago and then she took a break. Um, she has a couple little ones and uh, they're older now. So she's uh, getting back into the business and her youngest son was diagnosed with autism. Oh, wow. So she was really interested in coming up with something geared towards special needs. So we made the connection and we've teamed up and um, I started, well, we had a preview week in November, which allowed the kids to come try it out, see if it was for them. And then our official kickoff was in January and we've been doing it uh, every week and it's running through May. And then we're planning a showcase sometime in May to allow the kids and the adults to share what they've learned uh, with their friends and family. And oh, we're actually God. going to do that right in downtown New Philadelphia, which All is right. Square right there, you know, yeah. which is great. Um, so, you know, the community can come in and join and, you know, watch. But the great thing about the sensory and movement mm -hmm. is the fact that any of them, you know, no matter what their level is, they can participate in this. Now, what I've, how I've structured it is geared towards the dancer. So a lot of times we will do um, a freestyle dance and more or less like a follow the leader. I usually tell them, oh, it's time for a snake dance. So then, um, you know, we take turns being the leader and, you know, just moving our bodies to the music. And it's just amazing to watch them. A lot of times, you know, it takes them a little bit to warm up, but by, you know, the second or third song, they're just, they're going to town. Oh, and, to it, yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, it, it's, that's great. Yeah, it's so much fun. Um, just actually on Monday, we had a, a uh, young man join us and I knew him previously and this young man he just um you know real nice guy but just always kind of very flat mm -hmm. not showing much emotion uh-huh he came in and you know we started playing different music uh this week's theme was Mardi Gras Oh, fun. Of course, you know, <laughs> I got them all beads and um, little hats to wear. And we were just, you know, having a really good time. I put on some uh, Mardi Gras music and we were doing what we call a circle dance. So what that is, is everybody stands in a circle and then we take turns one by one going in the middle and again, being the leader. And uh, this young young man got in there and oh my goodness he just lit up just smiled <laughs> from ear to ear and he it was playing he was you know pretending to play the trombone and we right. all followed right. along and I mean that was just so touching to 
see oh, and light absolutely. up. Absolutely. Well, you know, and I think sensory, when we say the word sensory or sensory activities, that can be a little uh, intimidating to someone outside of occupational therapy. So that just kind of, I think this class makes it more user friendly and helps people probably to understand, oh, sensory doesn't have to be that complicated. It can be really just using creativity and movement uh, to meet different goals to meet some of those skills that we want our kids to work on. So what could you yes. like just describe just a few of the skills that you're looking at in that class, things you're addressing goal areas or focus areas that are getting addressed in that class? Yeah. Um, so of course, you know, like you said, the movement piece, you mm -hmm. know, that is, you know, addressing that, that what we would call vestibular um, input. Okay. And then also like a lot of times our movements, we're jumping, we're crawling, uh, you know, we're, we do play games. So maybe they have to crawl to the square and pick up something and take it over, you know, and drop it in a bucket or, you know, so th that piece that would cover that proprioceptive, that deep pressured input. Okay. And then um, just this week uh, for my little guys, who may have difficulties focusing a little bit more than uh -huh. older ones. so i like to do more hands-on type activities so what i did was um i drew uh, like mardi gras mask on contact paper so uh -huh. we did sticky pictures and i had different textures uh, that they could create their own mask and you know again that's tapping into that tactile that touch input with the different you know textures sure, and yeah. it really held a lot of their their attention and of course they were excited to take their pictures and you know show mom and dad what they had just made oh, yeah. so you know basically i'm trying to um you know give the kids and the adults just that sensory input. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times we have maybe the sensory seekers who are seeking more of that, that gross motor, the, the large movement, you know? So when I structure my classes, I try to keep in mind both our sensory seekers and our sensory avoiders. So, you know, maybe uh, my avoiders they're just not really into the large movement. Mm -hmm. So then I have um, uh, these little like suction cup people <laughs> that can suction onto the mirrors. Okay. And they love, they'll, they'll be over in the corner, you know, sticking those suction cups on the mirrors or uh, like the window clings mm -hmm. on the mirror. So I have stuff for them to explore while you know, my sensory seekers are having a good time, like moving their bodies, sure. you know, doing that large movement. So I try to keep in mind to plan for both of them, you know, that way both, all, everyone is involved somehow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Addressing all areas, fine motor and gross motor, large muscle yes. and fine motor muscles. Yes. Yeah, small muscle. So yes. yeah, very important. That sounds wonderful. I want to join a class, Farah. <laughs> Yes. Next time you're in Ohio. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'll make a point of it. Yes, please. Oh. Okay. Very cool. Well, um, let's just talk about, we'll finish up by talking about your book. And I want to give the link to that as well at the end of the podcast. Just let us know the name and more about the book that you wrote. Okay. Well, actually I have two books. Awesome. Um, okay. My first one, which I don't know if you can see here, but Oh, there oh, yeah. There we go. Tons okay. of tools to oh. help you me. That, yeah, yes. Wonderful. Okay. So that was my first one. And why I wrote this book actually goes back to a little girl um, that was in one of our preschool classrooms who had a high level of anxiety. Mm. she was just very anxious and she, it just it really limited what she could do throughout the day sure so I started incorporating calming tools 
into my OT sessions. And again, it was pushing. So everyone was enjoying, you know, these tools. So then I um, would take in an actual little toolbox mm -hmm. and they started to learn that every week we got a new tool. Oh, wow. Then I made a paper or a picture of a toolbox for each classroom to hang in their classroom. And every time I would introduce a new tool, I would give them an icon that they could hang in their toolbox. That way the teachers could practice the tool throughout the whole week. Mm -hmm. And we were just building more tools, you know, for their toolboxes. And the kids actually got on to going over to the toolbox and asking, you know, if they could do like the pinwheel breathing or the feather breathing, you know. And this little girl, she got on to that, the deep breathing. And her mom shared with me that it helped her tremendously during a doctor's visit. Nice. So, you know, getting that feedback, it just, you know, again, it really touched me. And I thought, wow, you know, if this is helping our kids, I would love to expand and help others. Absolutely. So then I started trying to figure out, well, how could I do that? And that's when I thought of, you know, writing a book. So that, that's, that's what inspired me for my first book. And, you know, again, I told you, I, I like to, um, you know, look at my own personal experience. And when I was a little girl, um, I was really shy and backwards. In mm -hmm. fact, I would have never dreamed I would be sitting here talking to you. I understand. <laughs> <an> interview. <laughs> yes. You know, uh, um, yeah. and I had a lot of anxiety myself mm. and, you know, I would, my way of dealing with that was, you know, crying and mm. my teachers didn't understand what was wrong with me. You know, why would I cry like every day? And you know, it was that I had, you know, that anxiety and I just didn't know how to express that, you know? And so again, I thought, man, I wish I would have had some common <laughs> tools to help me back then. Absolutely. You know? Yes. And these little guys, they just, they have a hard time. They can't, you know, our first thing we want to do is say, what's wrong? You know, mm -hmm. tell me what's wrong. And, you know, a lot of times they just can't. So again, this book, um, I, I wrote it so it could be used as a guide. You know, I have five calming tools and I have five alerting tools. Okay. Because <laughs> Not only do we need to calm ourselves, but sometimes <laughs> um, we can be, you know, just really tired, sure. really low energy, <laughs> and you know, we need the alerting tools to wake mm -hmm. ourselves up, you know, to try to have that nice even balance. Yes. So yeah. That's what this this book is all about, oh, and it just has some fun characters in it for the kids. And, um, you know, it's a good starting point. I, I tell the parents, you know, start with these, see if they work. And then you can build, you know, maybe your kiddo loves Play-Doh and squeezing Play-Doh, you know, calms them. Um, that's not in my book. So, you know, you have to find out what works for each individual person. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This sounds like a fantastic resource for families, for educators, for everybody, uh, for clinicians like myself, just, you know, everybody who's looking for a great resource of therapeutic ideas. So thank you. And thank you for explaining that point of finding the balance. We're looking for our kids to find a balance. So it's not always about 
calming we sometimes we have to do some alerting things sometimes they're grumpy or tired or you know just not really feeling like participating so it really is about finding that balance and it sounds like this book is a great resource for um tools that can help them do that so thank you i can't wait how where can people find that at where can we find your book at uh right now you can find it right on amazon you okay just on there and purchase it Wonderful. I'll put a link to that too. I'll be sure to post a link here uh, at the end of the podcast as well. And yeah. Amy, you know, um, when I wrote it, my age group that I was thinking about was, you know, those young kids, like three to maybe three to seven. Sure. But, mm-hmm. You know, really, this could actually apply to anybody. You know, I, yeah. I think of myself, I, I'm just not a morning person. Right. I wish I was. <laughs> right, but, right. No, I have to do stuff to get, you know, my motor started. Like, yes, I, I might have to drink some coffee, you know, or, you know, put some fast music on and start dancing around, you know. But uh, really, this book, any, all ages could, uh, you know, really relate to it. Oh, thank you so much for pointing that out. That is a great point in that sometimes we think of sensory as, oh, it's just somebody or a child, particularly with sensory processing disorder or sensory issues. But I try to explain to people, sensory is all of us. We all um, are, you know, operating with sensory issues or things, different sensory areas that maybe we need help with. So yeah, perfect example, just throughout the day, all the sensory that we're, we're exposed to and have to navigate. So like you said, waking up, feeling a little tired, not being a morning person, you need alerting sensory input, you know, very cool. I'm, th- I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. And it sounds like this, the activities here can help with either of those at any age range. <laughs> so that's good to know. Yeah. All right. Did you, oh, did you want to mention the second book as well before we wrap up? Yeah. All please. Right. So my second book is called oh, Sea of Feelings. Sea of Feelings. Okay. The star of the book is Scuba Farah. <laughs> I love it. So this book, you know, it goes hand in hand with my first book because what this does is it um, explains and identifies uh, feelings. Mm-hmm. And Scuba Farah takes the uh, underwater adventure and she meets all these different uh, sea creatures. And, you know, she's asking them, how does happy feel to you? And, you know, mm-hmm. what does that look like when you feel happy? Because, you know, how I look and how you look yeah. may, you know, may look different um so she goes through um seven or eight different feelings and how it affects you know your mind and your body you know um because like if you're scared you know it talks about blowfish his heart just beats really fast you know Mm -hmm. and it makes him really hard he he has difficulties thinking you know so it's at a level that a younger kiddo would you know understand sure, um, sure. and you know the thing is i feel like the more we build their vocabulary you know mm-hmm. the more we talk about feelings how i feel how you feel you know it just becomes you know just natural to them yes. so whenever you know, we do ask them, well, how, how do you feel about that? You know, they have that vocabulary. They can think back, oh, well, like blowfish, you know, yeah. I'm, 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 you know, I'm scared. So they can use those sea creatures and identify, you know, with their own feelings. So that's what that book was about. And I feel like, you know, the kids need to be able to identify how they're feeling. And then we can, you know, give them the tools to help them with those feelings. That's right. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And as you know, the first five weeks of this podcast, we're devoted to what is cell, what is social emotional learning um, yes. and learning it's self-management, self-control, self-regulation, emotional expression. So that book just goes hand in hand with everything um, that that's going on with the schools lately. You know, a lot of the schools are pushing this social emotional learning, which is wonderful. Um, we're working on that area area in 
school therapy. So this is just, it sounds like a fa- another fantastic resource that you have to offer. I'm really excited to, to check that out. Is that on Amazon as well? It is. And okay. Amy, um, I'm also really excited. I have a um, coloring book. Oh, cool. Canyon, uh, oh, to oh wonderful. Yeah, yeah. So it can yeah. be used as an extension activity. Um, you know, your kiddos, you can be reading the book. Maybe they have a favorite character and then yeah. they can color their favorite character. You know, that's a great way just for, you know, interaction, get them excited about the book. So my coloring book is also on Amazon. Oh, wonderful. I yeah. And then we're working on the fine motor component there, you know, working yeah. on coloring skills and grasp. Oh, this is really wonderful stuff. <laughs> I think we covered it all fair. I hope so. You have some, I'm sure so. there'll be something new coming out soon. You are just a creative genius. So thank you for sharing all this. Um, I will definitely post the links to everything. I encourage listeners to reach out and click on those links and check out all of Farah's amazing work, all of her offerings. Thank you so much for all of the wonderful work you're doing for children, for parents, for families, for educators, for all age ranges. It's just fantastic what you're doing. And I really um, appreciate you sharing today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on here. And thank you, Amy, for being one of my inspirations. Oh, (laughs) Farrah and I go way back (laughs) in the therapy world. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, I'll be sure to uh, put those links, post all the links to everything and have people reach out to you. Thanks. All right. Take care. Thanks.